uh, I would like to formally welcome everybody for the 79th AIOC 2021, the virtual conference. I am your hall coordinator, Himae. A warm welcome to all our judges and all our presenters. Welcome, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful first session. Now let's go with the second session, which is um, going to be our semi-finals. Was this the uh, one of the participants will be selected as a finalist? Okay. So first, I invite my judges, Dr. Anand Rajendran. Welcome, sir. Thank you. How are you doing today, sir? Then we have Dr. Malika Goel. Doctor, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Muna Bhende. Good morning, ma'am. I think you're muted. And Dr. Rupak Kanti Biswas. Dr. Biswas, how are you? Yeah, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you. Sir, can we have your video on, please? Yeah, this uh, from this device, it's not getting on. Some uh, apps is blocking it. I'm, I'm joining from the other devices with my video. Dr. Anand please. Rajindran? Yes. You wanted to know the uh, subtopics. So it's quality, originality, scientific value, application yeah. value, and timing, timekeeping. Yeah, I, I have it. Uh, Rupak made okay. it. So, yeah. uh, doctor, so we, we start with our first presenter. May I request one of our judges to please invite the presenter for Verito Retina? Okay. Uh, so, I'll invite the uh, presenter on behalf of the DOS. Image-based uh, biomarkers as predictors of response to anti-VEGF therapy in idiopathic choroidal neovascularization. Dr. Surbi Agarwal, please. Dr. Surbi, please can you share your screen and start the presentation? Uh, are my slides visible? Yes, you can go ahead. You're good to go. All the best. Just, uh, I'm not able to minimize the... Um, Sorry. A uh, very good morning to everyone, all esteemed judges and dear colleagues. The topic of my presentation today is imaging-based biomarkers as predictors of response to anti-VEGF therapy in idiopathic choroidal neovascularization. This work was done at RPC Ames. We do not have any financial disclosures. This work has been previously presented at American Academy of Ophthalmology and at the DOS 2020 conference. To begin with, idiopathic choroidal neovascularization, or ICNV, may account for up to 17% of CNV in young. It is a diagnosis of exclusion made in the absence of any predisposing lesion. Uh, however, due to its lower incidence, possibly, there is a positive of research regarding this topic. General outcomes are known to be better than secondary CNV. Our study was a retrospective chart review of 14 eyes of 14 patients diagnosed with idiopathic CNV. Uh, at, all, at all visits, the patients underwent a dilated fundus examination, OCT, and OCT angiography. Grading and analysis of all images was done by two independent mast observers. After diagnosis, the patients received an intravitreal anti-VEGF injection, and follow-up was done at three to four weeks. Further injections were administered on a PRN basis, uh, depending on subretinal fluid, hemorrhage, and decrease in visual acuity. Manual segmentation of all OCTA images was done to match the high flow areas on B scan. And the post treatment segmentation was matched to the pre treatment segmentation for all cases. Statistical analysis was done using Stata software and the Fisher's exact test. All proposed biomarker candidates were assessed with an association for decreased need for multiple anti VEGF injections. All of the 14 eyes in our study had a type 2 CNV and were followed up for a mean duration of 29.3 weeks. Of the 14 eyes, only seven eyes required a repeat injection, that is 50%. To begin the discussion, anti-VEGFs are widely used for the treatment of idiopathic CNV, and along with that, OCT angiography is uh, widely being integrated into practice for the diagnosis of similar pathologies. However, at present, no prognostic factors have been identified that help us to predict the stability of the membrane or the need for uh, a single or multiple uh, treatment sessions. To answer this study question, we uh, evaluated three possible biomarker candidates based on non-invasive imaging. The first candidate was pre-treatment morphology on OCT angiography. Membranes were classified as compact if a well-defined, highly anastomosing membrane uh, with a compact network of vessels was seen and the network was limited within the perimeter. It was classified as arborizing if multiple dendritic branching vessels were seen that were not limited within the perimeter of the network. 
11 of the 14 eyes in our study had a compact morphology that contrasts with the general morphology seen in AMD patients. This could be because our patients were all type 2 CNV and AMD is commonly type 1 CNV. We hypothesized that this difference in morphology might account for a better response in idiopathic CNV. But this factor was not found to be statistically significant. The second factor we analyzed was grading of response on OCT angiography. Response was graded as marked if there was a greater than 50% reduction in size of membrane and the, uh, but, and the original network could not be identified on follow-up. It was graded as moderate if there was a greater than 50% reduction in size of membrane. However, the original network could still be identified at follow-up. It was graded as mild if there was less than 50% reduction in size. This image shows a marked response. This image shows a moderate response. Uh, this factor was found to be statistically significant in our study. Of the seven patients who displayed a marked response, only one required a repeat intravitreal injection. Thus, a marked response to the first injection may indicate a more uh, stable membrane. Similar results have also been demonstrated by Rush et al. using ICG char characterization of idiopathic membranes. These results could also be replicated on OCT, but studies have shown that OCT has a lower sensitivity in detecting response to anti-VEGF as compared to OCT angiography. The third biomarker we can anal candidate we analyzed was RP healing. Our, as can be seen in this uh, pair of images, in the post-treatment image, we see a hyper-reflective layer that is continuous with the RP. This layer is not there in the pre-treatment images. However, a breach in the RP can be identified in the pre-treatment images, and this could possibly be the site of ingress of the CNV membrane into the subretinal space that gets healed in the post-treatment phase. We've, uh, on doing a literature search, we found that animal studies have demonstrated that af uh, after inject injection of an anti-VEGF histop on histopathology, the membrane can be seen to be covered by RP on both sides. And this coverage was not seen after a saline injection. Uh, these uh, few more images showing the uh, hyperreflective layer that we mentioned. Uh, the layer may be irregular in thickness, discontinuous, but it was there in several cases. However, this factor was not found to be statistically significant, but this is a novel clinical observation with sound histopathological support that definitely merits further research. To conclude, a marked response to the first anti-VEGF injection is a positive prognostic factor, and it signifies a clinical stable membrane that may remain that, may remain that way for a longer duration of follow-up. The small sample size was a limitation of our study. We would like to do, uh, with the advancement in automated measurements, quantitative changes in the uh, area of the CNV membrane as well as total vascular length could be analyzed to give a more quantitative idea of the reading of response. Raster B scans can be used to study RP healing, and we could also study these biomarkers in secondary CNV. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for your presentation. Judges, if you have any questions, we can ask her, please. Um, thank you, Surabhi. That was a very nice presentation. Thank My you, only concern is your comment on the RP healing. Because uh, when you said you have two membranes, the image of RP healing, the evidence of pre RP proliferation was very low. And the picture showed more of sub RP proliferation. So, how did you? Ma'am, I'm sorry, ma'am. The voice is breaking. I'm not able to hear. Sorry, ma'am. Uh, the RP healing comment was very interesting, but yes. I doubt this in the picture that you showed, to call it a type 2 CNVM, most of the proliferation should be above the RP, whereas in your image it was more below the RP. So where would you put that particular case? Uh, Ma'am, in the pre-treatment image, if we see, in the pre-treatment image, it was in the subretinal space. But after the treatment, uh, the RP could be seen proliferating above the membrane. So that is why it was uh, appearing to be in the, it was appearing to be a type 1 membrane later. So we feel that this could be a part of the response, as has recently also been described for a type 4 CNV, that a component of the subretinal and uh, sub RP layer, CNV is always there. And once we give the injection, the sub uh, subretinal component regresses and ingresses into the subretinal space and that is healed by the proliferation of the RP. So we would be revisiting as a totally purely type 2, but is there else it actually type 2? Okay, ma'am. It would be some revisiting, but it was a very interesting observation needs further. Yeah. 
Indeed, indeed it is. Yeah. Can we have the next speaker if there are no other questions? Yeah. Kerala, yeah. Kerala Society of Ophthalmic Surgeon, how has OCT angiography changed my practice patterns in AMD? Dr. Asmita Indurkar. Okay, can I start my presentation? Yes, please. Okay. I'm Asmita Indurkar, and today I'll be presenting my paper on OCT angiography in AMD. So OCT and dye-based angiography have been long used for the management of AMD. But now newer modalities have also come into play, like NFAS OCT, which is a transverse image at a specific depth and provides an extensive overview of the pathology. And OCT angiography, which is a non-invasive technique of generating volumetric angiographic images in a very short time. It is also depth resolved and you can see all these layers clearly and pinpoint the pathology. So our aim was to evaluate the evolving role and prognostic value of OCTA in patients of AMD. And we tried to incorporate the lessons learned in our clinical practice. So ours was a retrospective study of 330 eyes of consecutive patients of AMD that presented in 2018 and 2019. At the baseline, all patients underwent OCT angiography and fluorescein and endocinin green angiography, while on follow-up, OCT angiography was done. We excluded any CNVM which was secondary to other causes than AMD and images that were poor in quality. Majority of our patients were females and the most preponderant uh, disease pathology was neovascular AMD. So in dry AMD, we noted choreocapillary voids, which in 3.9% of the patients were more extensive outside the area of drusen which could be a potential biomarker for AMD progression. In 7.9% of these eyes, we noted an abnormal capillary network. These were eyes with no SRF and RP elevation. This is yet another example of non-exudative CNVM. However, we need to be very careful that we are not looking at a regressed or a partially treated memory. In one year follow-up, two eyes of non-exudative CNVM converted to exudative CNVM requiring treatment. We also looked at the morphological patterns of these neovascular AMD patients, and most of the patterns on ICGA correlated with those of OCTA. However, few of the uh, patterns of ICGA, like filamentous and ill-defined, showed a very specific network on OCTA. So these were the morphological patterns, lacy wheel, this is a medusa head, this is a CFAN uh, pattern with a feeder and network at one end, and this was a new kind of network that we saw, we called it a fishnet network, in which we saw more evolved membranes and it was not very discernible on ICG angiography. We also assessed the post-treatment response of all these morphological patterns, and we defined good anatomical outcomes as significantly decreased membrane size and decreased or absent SR. So most of the morphological patterns showed a very good anatomical outcome, except this fishnet pattern in which the vertical diameter of the lesion appeared to have increased post-injection. This is an example in which you can see these uh, small branching anastomotic channels have disappeared post-treatment, but the major trunk remains. And in this, the membrane size has increased, which is corresponding to the OCT post-treatment. We also compared the various imaging modalities in PCB, and BVN in OCTA was seen in all the patients, which is corresponding to ICG. However, polyp detection rate on OCTA was very poor. In, in fact, it was better in OCT NFAS. This is yet another interesting image, which is um, comparing all the imaging modalities and will highlight the differences between them. In ICGA, we know that dye traverses fast through the membrane, but is accumulated in the polyp, so polyp is better seen here. The flow of RBCs in the um, BVN is statically captured on octa, which is seen better in octa, and a, st a structural silhouette is seen on NFAS OCT. The treatment response in PCV is also seen better on OCT angiography. Here you see that the trunk is persistent. Probably this is the cause of recurrences in PCV because uh, none of the treatment modalities are actually targeting the memory. We also need to be aware of various artifacts that are um, associated with OCT angiography. In our study, the maximum, uh, the majority of uh, artifacts were segmentation artifacts, which was even more common in exudative eyes. So can OCT angiography replace angiography in diagnosis of AMD? For CNVM, yes. OCT angiography is very sensitive. In fact, it is better for poorly defined networks like fishnet pattern, which represents mature vessels and are resistant to anti-VGF treatment. For PCV, OCT angiography is as good as ICGA for detection of BVN. However, it is not good for polyp detection. 
But dry AMD OCT angiography is very useful. It will identify subclinical CNV prior to any other conventional imaging. Can OCT angiography replace angiography in treatment monitoring? Yes, OCT angiography is very useful in monitoring anti-VGF response. It is non-invasive. The image is not obscured by dye leakage. It is measurable, reproducible, has good repeatability, and in fact, is very good for recurrences. Is OCT angiography re reporting reliable? So if you're looking at the right place, in our study, automated avascular slabs were better than any other slabs. And also we need to be aware of the various artifacts that are associated with OCT, uh, like a segmentation artifact and probably remedy it with manual segmentation. In summary, yes, OCT angiography showed excellent and pattern identification. It is excellent for predicting treatment response, detection of BVN, and as a foul follow-up tool. So to come to my question, has OCT angiography changed my practice? Yes, in diagnosing and monitoring non-executive CNVMs, in delineating branching vascular network, in monitoring treatment response, and discovering variants with poor response to treatment. In conclusion, I would like to say that OCTA provides a new and easily repetitive investigative modality and is an integral part in diagnosis of AMD. In fact, it goes beyond the conventional angiography in terms of prognostication, assessing treatment response, and modifying treatment strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Judges, can we have some questions for her? Yeah, uh, Doctor Aspada, you provide a good the descriptive uh, uh, you know, profile of uh, Okta. I just want to ask you your assertions about uh, the value of uh, Okta in PCV. Um, I'm presuming that most of your cases won't have been very hemorrhagic. So before you say that it's you know very useful, uh, would you like to make that disclaimer that this should yes, be... Yes, sure. That is why we actually excluded all the images which were not good. Uh, that is very true, sir. Yeah, not, that's what. So, PCV doesn't always come in a package that is non -hemorrhagic. Right, right. So, the large hemorrhagic PEDs that we see, that is, like very difficult to find a membrane in that. that an is assertion right. that it is better than ICG. I think you have to put in that. No, I would like to say that it is as good as ICGA for uh, lots of re things, but still the gold standard will still remain as ICGA. No, that, it's As to be said, yeah. And uh, there are a few other things in which we, I would not like to go for Okta, but still it being non-invasive, like it is really very important. It has been very important in clinical practice. So that can, needs to be, that needs to be, you know, uh, brought out in your discussion and your yes. results. Also, we can see the number of cases you assessed in different categories. That question is about, uh, you said in uh, Okta for dry AMD, you treated when you saw fluid. Yes. The immediate question. But what about the visual equity? You didn't make a comment with respect to vision. Um, uh, so yes. Uh, become vision may not drop. Would you still treat? Vision is 6-6 six, six, with a bit of fluid there if you see. No, sir. We actually, uh, actually, we have not treated the patients which are sick. not come out through. But the, uh, but the two patients that we had uh, with the membrane and which turned exudative, the vision were not, uh, it was lesser than 6-6. Six, six. So we have treated those two patients the part of who, who were the part of our study. Okay. I think we can move on if there are no other questions. Anybody has any questions? Yeah. Should I invite the next speaker? Yes, please. From Uttarakhand State Ophthalmological Society, correlation of morphological characteristics of staphyloma with the structural and functional outcomes of myopic traction maculopathy after macular buccal surgery. Dr. Gitanjali Sood. Good morning, everyone. So I'll be presenting. Are my slides visible? Yeah. So as we all know, pathological my myopia is high axial myopia with characteristic pathological changes as posterior pole, which can have various manifestations like chorioretinal atrophy, posterior staphyloma, lacquer tracts, tube spots, CNVM, or retinoscysis. The surgical management is usually required for myopic fractional maculopathy, which has been classified by Shimada et al. into four stages. Stage one is uh, starting with the uh, irregularity of the outer epithelial epithelium, which progresses from a lamellar to full thickness hole. And in stage four, there is detachment at the fovea or macula. The management depends upon what is the primary force causing this traction. So if, if it is due to tau thyloid, then it surely needs vitrectomy. 
tangential portions need island peeling but if we see in this case the anterior posterior traction is due to cephaloma so these cases are definite indication for macular buccal surgery so we did a retrospective this was an interventional uh, retrospective case series on 11 cases who underwent macular buccal for symptomatic myopic tractional maculopathy they were analyzed to look for macular changes post surgery in patients with cephaloma a chart review was done for the oct characteristics along with the type of cephaloma according to curtin's classification and grade of cephaloma and we looked for the changes in bcv and oct at a post surgery at day 5 and at 2 months so this is the curtin's classification of cephaloma it divided into 5 uh, primary types and 10 uh, uh, 6 to 10 other secondary types type 1 and 2 other combinations type 1 is when it involves the disc and the macula type 2 cephaloma is involvement of the macula type 9 is further a subtype of type 2 which is common and here there is a septum that is present and there will be the two cephaloma cavities ultrasound grading is on the depth of cephaloma one is less than 2 mm two is 2 to 4 mm grade three is 4 to 6 mm and grade four is more than 6 mm uh, next slide So all the patients underwent macular buccal surgery under general anesthesia. This is to brief the surgical procedure after liberal conjunctival peritomy. All the four recti muscles were tagged, and the Devin and the Morin Devin edge wedge was prepared. I can show you in the image. Uh, this was the Morin Devin T-shaped wedge. This wedge will go under the macula, and this uh, encircle arch will be placed under the recti muscle, and this band will be under the lateral rectus. So it goes horizontally under the lateral rectus. Then we put a chandelier and assess for the indent, and then then this encircle arch ends up tied in the inferior nasal and superior nasal quadrant, and they are tightened, and we finalize the indent, and then the conjunctival tendons are sutured. So the results of our study was the age group was 35 to 65 years. The average axial length was 27.26 millimeters, and average myopia was minus 10 diopters. There were seven patients with type one cephaloma, uh, three patients with type two, and one patient with type one. These will be taken as a single category. So uh, the grading of cephaloma was mostly the patients. patients were with grade 1 one, one patient with type 2 with grade 2 and two patients with type uh, of type 1 cephaloma had grade 4 cephaloma the preoperative oct features were outer retinal stenosis was present in all patients macular retinal detachment in eight out of which five were type 1 full thickness macular hole in four patients two each lamellar macular hole in three patients all were in type 1 tau posterior hyaloid in three and foveal retinal detachment in two So these are the structural and functional outcomes we noted postoperatively. This is the representative case of type two, where we can see foveal retinal detachment, outer retinal stenosis, and scarred uh, cerium. After macular buccal surgery, we can see a high indent, and there is excellent resolution of stenosis and foveal detachment. This is type nine cephaloma. We see two cephaloma cavities, and the disc is on the slope. This is a uh, lamellar hole and retinal stenosis. After uh, uh, macular buccal surgery, there is excellent resolution of stenosis and hole, but there was some fluid which also disappeared at six months. This is type one cephaloma with full thickness macular hole, outer retinal stenosis, and macular retinal detachment. Post surgery, the hole closed, but the fluid was persistent. So, looking at the surgical results, the retinal stenosis uh, there was a significant reduction in three out of four patients at two months. But only in one patient at uh, two months in type one cephaloma group. As we look for the macular detachment, the macula attached in all patients with type two, type nine cephaloma. But only more than ninety percent reduction in fluid was noted in patients with type one cephaloma. The hole closed in both the patients with type two cephaloma, but only in one patient with type one cephaloma. The functional outcome. After surgery, there was an improvement in vision in all the patients with type two nine cephaloma, but only in two patients with type one cephaloma. Three maintained vision, two worsened. So the age and duration of symptoms, if we compare, were comparable in both the groups. The axial length was slightly higher in type two cephaloma. BCV was comparable, but uh, post surgery there was significant improvement in BCV. So we tried to explain why this better surgical outcome. So we, when the macular buccal is placed. The uh, type one cephalomas are the wider types, and the type two cephalomas are the narrower types. So they will have a better uh, reduction in the in the in the cephaloma cavity and a convex shape and in, inward centrally acting centripetal forces. 
similar pathology was described by oe et al who told the type 2 cephalomas have more chances of development of macular hole and retinal detachment so the morphological type of cephaloma and axial lens can help us prognosticate possible outcomes after buccal surgery with type 2 9 cephaloma having a better structural and functional outcome i would like to thank igo for publishing this as a paper in the recent issue and uttarakhand state of thermic society for giving me the opportunity to present this and dr pradeep sir thank you very much thank you dr gitanjali uh, can we have the judges to ask any questions if they want to i just i would like to know uh, dr gitanjali if yes, you yes, so if you do you find any role for vitreous surgery in cephaloma and can you say that this type since it did not do well with buckling it might do well with vitrectomy ma'am there was a subgroup we also analyzed who underwent combined procedure so if we pre operative ocd is very helpful we see that the interior posterior traction is also significant so those those group also underwent combined with vitrectomy surgery with macular buckle so if it, we need to look at the pre operative features to decide for that so in your uh, cases in your cases which did not do well post buckle did you go ahead and do a vitrectomy later so, uh, two patients underwent vitrectomy after that that's what i wanted to know how would you direct a patient towards vitrectomy versus this and what are your indications for combining uh, this thing and did you have any complications i don't know if you skipped that or yes, sir. what were your complications uh... So, uh, one patient had a supracoroidal hemorrhage after surgery which was managed conservatively he improved one patient had a suture intrusion so we lasered that side uh, it uh, did need, not work need to be mentioned because it's an aggressive invasive and a novel technique you would need to mention those uh, issues also yes, yeah dr gitanjali this is a very uh, interesting subject but again the mm -hmm. number is uh, short as you know yes, so uh, can you can you just ask a question do you have any any uh, pre operative uh, criteria for selecting this these cases we will select for this and these cases we should not like pre operative vision criteria or existing along with staphyloma the the macular degeneration those are the criteria did you uh, did you see it so mostly we took patients who were like symptomatic and who had worsened like if on follow up over worsening and their the stitches was worsening or they developing they were developing detachment so those patients were taken up for surgery only symptomatic patient not who were not symptomatic and they had just stitches and they had a wider staphyloma okay we'll move on to our next thank you presentation yeah right sir we... doctors now uh, this was verito retina we have three participants and now we'll go with the uh, other participants winner of vitreo retina session 1 dr vivek dave okay dr dr goel uh, am i audible may i share my screen yes yes yes, yes. sir loud and clear you can share I hope it's a full screen now. Yes, sir. It is full screen. Yeah, yeah. right. Go. I'll yeah I'll start off. Uh, good morning, uh, respected judges. I'll start off with my topic: uh, subretinal injection of uh, stem cell derived RP cells, a six-month safety and integration in a rat model. I have no financial disclosures. So, retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic degenerative retinal disorder with no specific uh, definitive cure as of present. Among the various proposed uh, therapies or therapeutic uh, lines uh, in the future. one that is uh, in induced uh, the maximum interest is the usage of induced pluripotent stem cells here in a mature cell is taken from a donor and this cell is exposed to reprogramming yamanaka factors to create a stem cell out of it and then this stem cell can be exposed to other differentiating factors and create a mature cell of your choice which can then be transplanted in the diseased tissue in our previous work uh, presented at the aios last year Uh, we took uh, lab grown ips derived rp cells and injected them in the subcutaneous space of nude mice now nude mice are mice models which do not have an immune system this is done because these rps derived rp cells have a potential to develop teratomas which can be picked up in a nude mice model uh, luckily and safely we could show that uh, these rp cells well integrated into the subcutaneous tissue and did not show any abnormal proliferation nor induction of teratoma in the nude mice over the observational period of 6 months now on this background or using this background we went ahead to assess the safety and integration of subretinal injection of these cells now in an animal model at a 6 month window 
This was an ex vivo prospective preclinical animal study using the blind RCS rat model. And this study was conducted in conjunction with the LVPI and the National Center for Laboratory Animal Sciences at the National Institute of Nutrition, Hyderabad. The study was approved by appropriate institute review boards and all animal handling was done in accordance with the ARVO statement. Now, why use a dystrophic RCS rat? This is because these rats carry a natural acquired mutation wherein a slow degeneration occurs of the RP and the photoreceptor cells and the entire outer nuclear layer and the RP cells in these animals disappear by a 12 week age. Hence, in that time frame, if you inject any cells and then pick them up on histopathology, it would be shown that those are the cells that you have injected and not those of the host tissue. This is the setup uh, that we used at NIN. This is a dissecting microscope. And with the help of a veterinarian surgeon, the animal was anesthetized under ketamine. And this was the operative setup that we used. This is a small video clip showing how we did the subretinal injection in these eyes. So a limbal incision was made with our routine MVR and it was extended inside to incise the retinal tissue. Here when you can see the MVR is reaching the subretinal space. Now 0.2 million of IPS derived RP cells on a 28 gauge flat needle on a Hamilton syringe was put in the subretinal space and a slow injection was done. Herein you will see the entire pigmented mass nicely being demonstrated in the subretinal space. These mice were then kept at the holding facility and were then sacrificed at a six month interval. Six months down the line, we could see these nice patches of pigmentation in the subretinal space, indicating the presence of the retinal pigment epithelial cells. An immunohistochemical evaluation of this photograph shows a very nice tract showing the way in which the RP cells go across the retina and enter into the subretinal space. The important part of the evaluation was this immunohistochemical picture, which showed these uh, immune, uh, this uh, induced pluripotent stem cell induced RP cells nicely homing onto the Brooks membrane and spreading out there uniformly. Another important observation was the photoreceptor layer in the corresponding area of the neurosensory retina showed preservation and regeneration. Further immunohistochemical markers showed the PAX6 was positive, indicating that these are RP cells. The H mito antigen was positive, indicating that these are the cells of the human IPS derived RP that we had injected in the subretinal space. And the DAPI stain was positive, showing that the nuclei of the injected RP cells were actually alive. In conclusion, live pigmented RP cells survived in the subretinal space beyond three months of injection. No tumor formation was noted till six months post injection. The RP injection protected the underlying photoreceptor layer from degeneration. At six months, the injected cells also expressed the human specific mitochondrial and RP specific markers showing that they are live and they are viable. Unfortunately, due to the COVID-19 effect, we could not escalate the experiments and check for the functional assessment, which would be our next step. And once that is done, we would be on course to apply for appropriate clearances for a future human trial. Thank you everyone for your kind attention. I'll be happy to take uh, questions if any. Yeah, Dr. Vivek, uh, very impressive uh, uh, experiment. In, uh, I mean, it's great to see a vision scientist like that working. I just have a couple of questions. Okay. One is, uh, um, you said there was regeneration of the photoreceptors that you could make out. You showed that on your slide. But how did you know? Because this was a sacrificed animal. How did you establish that there was a repopulation? Yeah, so uh, all the animals uh, that we used, we injected them in one eye and the other eye was an internal control. So in these experiments, what was done is uh, at the point of sacrifice, both the eyeballs were excised out. And because at the given timeline, we would have expected the RP and the photoreceptors to degenerate, uh, this was shown in the control eye. And in the corresponding area, when we would see cells uh, in the experimental eye, that would tell us that the photoreceptor layers in that eye is present, whereas it is absent in the control eye. So it is a presumptive uh, repopulation com comparing it to the fellow eye? Comparing it to the fellow eye, because that would take care of all possible confounders uh, that we could have. Sure. And what was your success failure ratio and how many rats did you uh, have to sacrifice? Yes, I think that's an important question. We uh, used, we had conducted this experiment on 18 eyes. 
the first four eyes we lost that was a small learning curve, curve where we realized that uh, if we get a hemorrhage in the subretinal space though the rpe cells may be still present down the line they actually are non viable so it is very important in such situations to be able to inject the rpe cells in the subretinal space without causing any hemorrhage hemorrhage was uh, inducing inflammation in the subretinal space and whatever we were seeing in the hemorrhagic eyes was only pigmentation with ghost cells and all these cell specific viability markers were negative so we had success in about 14 eyes and four eyes were lost uh, to hemorrhage yes, uh, i'm sorry dr bende i'm not able to get you nice presentation i thank you I just wanted to know uh, six months is fine, but are you do you have a population that you're waiting for longer than six months because we are looking for malignant changes? Is there any population where you haven't yet? Right. Uh, the most of the population or most of the studies uh, which have looked for any uh, tumorogenic side effects have looked at their results till six months. for functionality what we would actually require is uh, uh, holding the animal still one year like you have mentioned that unfortunately due to the covid period we could not handle those uh, uh, you know hold up those animals further so this phase of experiments you would have to possibly repeat and uh, hold the animal still one year to check for functionality but the tumorogenic effect most literature is accepting a uh, 6 month time window window that is why we propound our uh, results from a safety point of view at 6 months thank you good so the next speaker is the uh, winner of victor retina session 2 dr divya agarwal good morning everyone is my screen visible ma'am yeah so good morning everyone today i'll be presenting my free paper on modified mioct guided management of submacular bleed in cases of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy this is a novel study in indian settings so as we all know submacular hemorrhage is accumulation of blood between the rp and the neurosensory retina or under the rp and there are various causes which can be various listed like amd pcv myopia and they can cause significant vision loss if not treated in time because of shearing effect on the photoreceptors by the contraction of fibrin or due to iron related toxicity or due to macular scar or progression of bvn so there have been various literature published on the management of submacular hemorrhage which involves pneumatic displacement fibrinolysis antivegf agents and so we know that in pcv it's a it's more common in asian ancestry as compared to amd and we have seen more of pcv eyes in our setup and these are very prone to recurrent and massive subretinal and sub rp hemorrhage so we tried to study the uh, to study conduct this study because various techniques have been described in the literature for the management of submacular hemorrhage but the surgical management in pcv eyes needs to be extensively studied and with the advent of microscope integrated intraoperative optical coherence tomography real time imaging is available which can result in better clinical judgments so we actually modified uh, the previous techniques of subretinal tpa injection so we did uh, we did, used a cocktail we first did pass planar vitrectomy followed by submacular injection of cocktail of recombinant tpa which is to uh, uh, liquefy the clot then bevacizumab this bevacizumab is used to prevent rebleeds and to treat the branch vascular network and air so air is used to for pneumatic displacement of the blood subretinally so we normally uh, do artificial detachment using 41 gauge micro translocation needle and then we inject this cocktail then at the end of the surgery gas tamponade is given using uh, short term tamponade using 18% ss6 gas and post operatively propped up positioning was advised so this is a sample surgery so we did core vitrectomy for a large submacular hemorrhage involving the center of the fovea in a case of polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy induced the pvd using tricot then we did the core vitrectomy removing the vitreous 
after that we use miocit to detect the area of the largest hemorrhage the height the area where the height of the hemorrhage is largest and the areas of suspected pd because it is uh, these areas of pd are to be avoided for subretinal injection then based on that location we started injecting the cocktail first there will be tpa followed by avastin and you see the clot is get uh, the bleed is getting displaced using artificial detachment and the, at at the end 0.3 ml air was injected subretinally to displace the bleed from the fovea so the basic aim was to just to displace the bleed from the fovea and the retinotomy is self sealing because it's made of 41 gauge and then fluid air exchange was performed and gas tamponade was given using 18% sf6 gas so the, we we obtained very encouraging results because these patients often tend to worse, uh, do not tend to improve with intravitreal tpa and uh, anti vegf therapy also uh, after intravitreal therapy prone, some prone position is usually advised but in our technique propped up position is advised and we directly tackle the subretinal pathology we directly displace the bleed towards the inferior arcade and we have got some good results so this is one case showing uh, a large submacular hemorrhage involving uh, till the vascular arcades and post operatively the you can see there is complete resolution of bleed all uh, but the choroid is still thickened because it's a pachycoroid syndrome and there is a good gain of visual acuity from finger counting to 69 at 6 months so we did a prospective interventional study we uh, included 20 eyes of 20 patients and we followed them till for 6 months most of the patients had were old and uh, most of them had uh, hemorrhage extending to vascular arcade center of fovea was involved and baseline visual acuity was very poor so at the end of 6 months we could assess that complete displacement of hemorrhage from macula and resolution of bleed was achieved in all the cases and there was a significant improvement of bcva so at the pre uh, baseline bcva was around finger counting or hand movement close to face which turns out to be 0.64 logmar units and at the end of 6 months it improved to 0.82 logmar units which is around 624 and the p value is significant in all intervals also the average time of resolution of bleed is around 7.6 weeks which is pretty decent in our case series we have got two cases have developed breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage so the amount of vitreous uh, vitre because of large amount of pre existing subretinal bleed but they also recovered with propped up position and conservative management so at the end i would like to conclude that favorable uh, outcomes can be achieved by initiation of ppv with subretinal injection of cocktail of tpa avastin and air due to effective displacement of bleed at the same time it also helps in simultaneous treatment of underlying pathology and role of ioct is immense in these cases as this can help in deciding Area, deciding the area of injection, avoiding uh, uh, any areas of pigment epithelial de detachment, and in aiding in precise delivery of drug to the subretinal space. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, Dr. Agarwal, a very uh, nice uh, uh, presentation and study. Thank you, sir. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. One is, uh, why did you choose 2.5 uh, uh, like milligrams of the dose for as in intravitreally we have 1.25 so is there any reason you doubled the dose for a subretinal uh, administration sir actually uh, we published a similar series uh, four years back in cases of neovascular amd and when we used uh, 0.1 ml of uh, 0.1 ml routine dose of avastin we could we have to inject uh, post operatively in cases because 0 0.05 ml you mean 1.05 yes, ml 0.05 ml routine dose then we have to inject in uh, post operatively because the uh, vascular network was not completely regressed so we altered the dose to 2.5 mg 0.1 ml and then we obtained uh, some good results in that because of regression of cnvm complex so we tried to carry out the same concentration in this and we hope uh, and we got uh, good results most of our patients didn't require any future injections also despite having pcv so uh, bvn complex was effectively tackled using 2.5 mg dose and future studies uh, dose comparison can be done for subretinal injection doses that was going to be my second question as to what was your rate of recurrence and whether you had to do repetitive treatment after Sir, uh, actually, in our series, we were pretty lucky. We didn't uh, do, we didn't 
and counter uh, future anti vegf injections may be due to the increased concentration of anti vegf which we injected at the first time but two of our uh, two of our patients developed uh, post operative vitreous hemorrhage due to breakthrough bleed and that got resolved with conservative management in those cases we injected uh, uh, injection avastin just uh, okay. injection anti vegf just to expedite the uh, reso resolution of bleed Just one quick question: Did you take a special consent when you were injecting double the dose? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the trial is CTRA approved, and we we obtained all the required consents, ma'am. And there is no evidence of toxicity. The visual acuity improved from finger counting to twenty-four in nearly every case, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If time permits, can I ask a question? Please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, did you prefer to go on the superior part of macula with your retinotomy or the inferior was there a preference to that ma'am actually previously when we didn't use ioct we used to inject superior temporally because uh, that's uh, that area is quite uh, ma'am that that was our preferred approach but using ioct we uh, or using pre op positive ssoct could pick up areas of ped we avoided areas of ped and then choose the area which is having maximum height of subretinal bleed so that added to our uh, that added to our effective displacement of bleed very good <clears throat> thank you thank you ma'am so <clears throat> Yeah, can we, we invite the next yeah. speaker? Yeah. The next Thank speaker you. is the winner of the Vitreo Retina paper session three, Dr. Tapas Ranjan Padi. Uh, very good morning. Are my slides visible? Am I audible enough? Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, very good morning, respected panelists. With pleasure, I take you through this interesting study entitled. Can rate of retinal vascular growth be a predictor for treatment in babies with retinopathy of prematurity? Retinopathy of prematurity is a disorder of immature retinal vasculature. Various systemic factors modulate the disease severity and incidence via a common endpoint of mm -hmm. retinal mm -hmm. vascular stasis or decelerated vascular output. This led us to analyze the rate of retinal vascular growth. Per week in treatment naive eyes with retinopathy of prematurity, and to evaluate whether it could be a predictor of treatment need. This was a ten-year study, partly retrospective and partly prospective, from first January 2010 till 2019 at LB Prasad Eye Institute, Bhuvneswar. We included babies cared for retinopathy of prematurity with clear fundus, showing the disc and vascular endings in one imaging field. Those with incomplete details, stage four and five, and no consent were excluded. We used Redcam Subtle and Three Nitra Neo for for calculation of the speeds. Two retina specialists masked to the uh, postmenstrual age and treatment need did all the evaluations. While a third examiner cross-checked the inbuilt caliper system available with Redcam Subtle was used for calculation. While in Forus, we used Man measuring scale manually for the calculations. The image enhancement was done with red green software to make the blood vessels stand out. The horizontal disc diameter was taken as the unit of measurement. So the speed was calculated as s is equal to a by d divided by p minus seventeen, where a is the distance of the end of the blood vessels from the midpoint of the temporal or nasal optic disc margin. And D is the horizontal disc diameter. P is the postmenstrual age examination. And based on the previously published report, we assume that the blood vessels reach the optic disc margin at 17 weeks of gestational age. These are the statistics we used. We compared the speed between the different groups. We also assess the uh, reproducibility of the result by using inter-class inter correlation coefficient among the observers. The, rate, the ROC curve was used to assess the predictive value of the speed and deciding the treatment need. There were 436 eyes from 233 babies classified into group one, treatment requiring ROP, group group two, ROP spontaneous regression, group three, prematurity but no ROP. This acted as control. The group one was further subdivided. 
the rate of retinal vascular growth in disc diameter per week was lowest in treatment warranting group followed by spontaneous regression followed by no rop where it was 0.71 the subgroup analysis showed the rate to be the lowest with aggressive posterior retinopathy of prematurity, followed by threshold, hybrid, and high risk pre threshold. We measured all the quadrants uh, wherever feasible, but the examiners had a tendency to calculate the supratemporal and inferotemporal quadrant more often. The speed in the nasal quadrant was more than 50% as less than the temporal quadrant. And when we calculated the speed versus the treatment need, irrespective of the group, we found that when the speed is less than 0.4, 99% is required treatment. The receiver operating characteristics showed that rate of vascular growth could be a significant predictor of treatment need. And the cutoff value set was 0.56 for supratemporal, 0.57 inferotemporal, 0.5 for horizontal temporal with the following accuracy. The major limitations was the measurement in a flat laptop screen, where in actuality, in reality, the blood vessels traverse a curved ocular surface. Lack of FFM, we compensated this by using the red-green enhancement to make the blood vessels stand out. The rate of vascular growth is not uniform. We assumed it to uniform between the two points of time, but actually the change from day to day. The rate different in different quadrant, we addressed it by calculating the average as well as comparing each quadrant. Issues of reproducibility, we ensure it by using inter-observer correlation coefficient and use two observers. Errors due to image magnification was addressed by using the ratio as the measurement unit rather than the absolute value. To conclude, retinal vascular growth, uh, the rate of retinal vascular growth could be quantifiable and could predict the treatment need with many extrapolative use uh, that can be used for us. The rate is inversely proportional to the disease severity, lowest in aggressive posterior retinopathy of and slowest in the horizontal nasal quadrant. At a retinal vascular outgrowth less than 0.54 disc diameter per week, there, there is a high probability of treatment need. I acknowledge all of them for their support, either direct or indirect. And uh, thank you all for your kind attention. So uh, impressive uh, study, uh, truly, uh, to Tapas, uh, great attempt. I just want to know, uh, it didn't come out very clearly, you used two, uh, you used the retinam shuttle and the three netra uh, to image. So for all these, were they standardized to one imaging modality or uh, was it a mix of two? Because so the, we the magnification which matters here. So, you know, because you're calculating, like you, I correctly said, a curved surface, but you're looking at it on, on an imaging flat screen. So that factor becomes very important when you make, uh, you know, Yeah, very, uh, very true. This is the reason why you use the ratio. So whatever we uh, measured the distance of the end of the blood vessels from the optic disc margin, with respect to the horizontal optic disc diameter. So like this uh, shown here. So we use the ratio. So even if the image gets magnified, the ratio remains same. The ratio that is the uh, A by D divided per week. That is retinal vascular outgrowth per week. All right. Yes. Yes. Very nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, could you look at uh, any changes that varied with the stage of the disease? We looked at the quadrants. Can you repeat? Your volume is a little uh, less, Dr. Muna. You're not hearing you at all now. She said, does it vary with the state of the disease and not just the quadrants which she mentioned? Yes. I Yes, ma'am, it varied. Uh, so if we see that we, uh, to, uh, to help us in real life situation, we did the measurement in terms of the threshold ROP uh, versus AP ROP and high risk pre threshold ROP. So in threshold ROP, we saw that uh, the, uh, the uh, speed was the uh, second lowest compared to the AP ROP. So whereas in uh, high risk pre threshold, and in no ROP group where there was no disease at all, the rate was maximum. Thank you.
can we go to the next speaker then doctor yes, yes please anand okay uh, thank you very much dr padi the next speaker is the there are two winners of the vitro retina session 4 the first one dr nishita yadav dr nishita yadav yes yes ma'am can you hear my voice ma'am yes i'll just share my screen ma'am yeah Uh, a very good morning to everyone i am presenting on interweaving structural and functional findings in mactel type 2 it was done at mm joshi i institute hubli no financial disclosure the objective of the study was multimodal imaging of eyes with mactel type 2a and correlation with staging systems by each modality and to analyze the effect of various grades on multimodal imaging on visual function using multifocal erg so mactel type 2 as we all know it is a neurodegenerative disorder that primarily affects the muller cells staging has been done basis on clinical findings oct faf F and ffa recently octa has given us insight about the deeper capillary plexus which is mainly the origin of pathology of this disease coming to method methods it was a cross sectional study conducted from may 2017 to 2019 patients with mactel type 2a diagnosed clinically on sd oct ffa and faf with octa were included patient excluded were non proliferative type of mactel coexisting diabetic retinopathy age related cnvm uh, myopic cnvm glaucoma and optic nerve diseases slit lamp uh, grading was done according to gasatol that was stage 1 to 5 one was stage 1 is foveal and parafoveal gray stage 2 is the telangiectatic vessel stage 3 is the right angle dipping of the venule stage 4 is intraretinal pigment stage 5 is cnv oct grading done according to salo et al that is grade 1 break in isos junction confined temporal to the fovea grade 2 uh, it has reached the foveal center grade 3 it is nasal and temporal to the fovea and grade 4 any signs of neovascularization faf grading done according to wong et al grade 1 is uh, absence of normal reduced autofluorescence of fovea grade 2 mild increase in autofluorescence in parafoveal region in grade 3 it is heterogeneous ffa grading done according to toto et al grade 1 is temporal changes grade 2 is temporal and nasal grade 3 is full involvement and grade 4 any signs of neovascularization octa done according to the toto et al classification grade 1 mainly the vascular anomalies is in the deep and or superficial plexus but temporal to the fovea Grade two temporal and the nasal. Grade three is circumferential and grade four is neovascularization. So we recorded individual MFERG responses for sixty one hexagonal elements and we have gra- uh, grouped in to R one to R five. R one was less than two degree. R two was two to five degree. R three was five to ten degree. R four was ten to fifteen degree and more than fifteen degree was R five. And we recorded average amplitude of P one in all the rings and compared it with the controls. P1 N1 P1 N1 ratio was significantly reduced in all the four rings except for R5. So we have divided the voltage of P1 uh, into four quartiles, and with interquartile range being the same, so that we can correlate easily with the other imaging modalities. So we have divided into four stages. So coming to results, 29 eyes of 16 patients of macular type 2 and 25 eyes of 19 normal patients. Mean age among patients was fifty seven point four years. Thirteen patients we included both the eyes. In three patients only one eye was included, and in mean DCVA was point zero three eight plus minus point two six. Clinically, we found graying of temporal retina was seen in hundred percent of the patient, followed by right angle venule staging. Stage four was more common, that is intraretinal pigments. We also measured the EZ disruption. Length and ELM disruption length, and compared it with MFERG on SDOCT and FAF. Stage three was most common. Uh, on FFA and Octa also, stage three was most common. So this this is a representative case with uh, grading on OCT that is grade one temporal involvement. On uh, FAF it is grade two, and uh, uh, on OCT again it is temporal involvement. So OCT A so it is uh, grade one. on mferg mainly the central ring uh, that is more affected the amplitude is more affected in central ring and, and temporal is uh, parafoveal segment was more affected than the nasal one so sd oct correlated well with all the imaging modalities but it was not significant with octa 
similar with FAF, uh, it, it correlated well with all the imaging modality except for OCTA. But in contrast, FFA correlated well with all the imaging modalities, including OCTA. OCTA has positively correlated with all the imaging modalities, but it was only significant with FFA grading and R1P1 amplitude. And R1P1 amplitude has uh, correlated positively and significantly with all the uh, modalities. Coming to discussion, Okada et al. They have found MFERG preserve and uh, responses. They have preserved N1, that means photoreceptor is not involved, and this reduced P1, that means it suggests inner retinal dysfunction, and center and temporal part is more involved than the nasal part, and outer rings were not involved. But in contrast, Narayanan et al. They found uh, that there was generalized reduction in P1 amplitude in all the rings. In our study, we have not found that. R5, it was not significant. Toto et al. had correlated various modality imaging and they have found Octa has correlated well with all the imaging, but in our study, we have not found so. In Octa has only correlated with FFA and multifocal ERG. So coming to conclusions, to the best of our knowledge, it is the first study with structural and functional correlation using multimodal imaging. Octa can be a non-invasive marker for capillary abnormalities and high correlation of R1P1 amplitude with existing multimodal imaging can give us information about the foveal function in MacPhil type 2. Thank you, everyone. Uh, doctor, for these uh, the various things that you saw, the multimodal imaging, can any of these help you with the prognosis? Prognosticating uh, a case? Pro uh, prognosis, mainly the uh, multifocal ERG, gives the functional assessment and may, if we have compared it with uh, uh, best corrected visual acuity also and uh, we have found it has uh, correlated positively with uh, best corrected visual acuity. But are you able to say that this particular case is going to progress uh, faster than the other uh, case based on your findings, based on these imagings? Uh, no, ma'am. We have not found that. Only the EZ disruption and the ELM disruption that we have seen in higher stages. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. So very impressive structure function correlation, as we mentioned earlier in the semi-final, in the preliminary round, uh, microperimetry would have been useful, but uh, this is pretty impressive. Thank you, sir. Any other questions from the judges? We still have time. So now can we skip to the last uh, presenter, please? Yes. yes. Uh, the winner of the Vitor Retina session four, the other winner is Dr. Prashant Bhavankule. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen. <clears throat> Here it is. Okay. This is a comparative study of success of various techniques of ILM peel in management of RRDs with PVR more than C1 and concomitant macular hole. Incidence of macular hole in RD is varies from 2.5 to 4% and majority of them are associated with PVR. We are well aware that macular hole happens because of a pool of vitreous on the macula or basically because of the tangential traction. ILM peeling technique as well as inverted ILM peeling technique has increased the success rate of full thickness macular hole in attached retina. Does it hold true in detached retina was the question. Our aim was to assess the anatomical and functional success of vitrectomy in patients with RRD with PVR equal to or more than C1 and coexisting macular hole using different management strategies of ILM peel. This is a prospective non-randomized interventional uh, study where 23 eyes were divided into three groups. Group one had just plain vitrectomy with membrane peels. Group two had ILM peel and group three had uh, inverted ILM peel. Patients with myopia more than six diopters or PVR less than C1 and recurrent RDs were excluded from the study. This is a pre-operative OCT of few of the patients where we could acquire it. In fact, OCT was not possible in um, a majority of the cases and macular hole size and OCT predict predictors could not be ascertained in majority. 10 patients intraoperatively were detected to have macular hole, possibly because of large bullous RD and severe PVR. 
Technique was standard 23 gauge vitrectomy in all the cases without encircling band. ILM peeling was done in group 2 and 3 as mentioned. All the patient received silicone oil tamponade. Baseline characteristics across the three groups in terms of age, sex, and preoperative visual acuity matched. Three patients in no peel group had recurrent retinal detachment, while only one patient out of 10 in, invert, uh, in peel group had recurrent retinal detachment. None of the patient in inverted island peel group had recurrent retinal detachment. Recurrent retinal detachment was assessed at the end of three months following silicon oil removal. KM plot showed a significant p-value of 0 0.029, indicating that wherever the island peeling was done, in island pool groups, the recurrent rate uh, was lesser. And importantly, the, if the recurrence had to happen, it happened at a later period postoperatively. Two patients had PVR-related recurrent retinal detachment. Two patients in no pill group had macular hole opening. One had associated peripheral PVR, while one had simple macular hole reopening leading to recurrent retinal detachment. This is a representative post-operative fundus photograph taken at one month at and OCTs at one month of no ILM peel and ILM peel group. While this is a fundus photograph taken at one month in an inverted flap group, this is OCT at first post-operative day where you can see the ILM material stuffed in the macular hole, while this is at one month where you can see near normal restoration of the macular structure. Post-operative visual gain was significant in ILM peel groups compared to no peel groups, though it did not come uh, true statistic, it didn't become statistically significant. So to conclude, better macular hole closure and retinal reattachment rate was achieved with inverted ILM flap technique in cases of RRD with concomitant macular hole and significant PVR. And this is about single surgery su success rate. Visual gain is seen more in inverted ILM peel group compared to no peel groups. Though challenging and not free of complications, inverted ILM peel can be considered as a procedure of choice in these cases. Yes, the limitation is ours was a small sample group and we need large randomized studies to confirm our results. Thank you. And meanwhile, this has come in for publication in the Egyptian Retinal Journal. Thank you. Prashant, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, what, did you, uh, what did you do when you used the inverted flap and there was no peripheral pain? These are all... Uh, I said regimatogenous retinal detachment with associated PVR-C1. It was not just detachment because of plain macular hole. No, no. I meant whether there was a peripheral break. Yes, all the cases had peripheral break as well, ma'am. Concomitant macular hole was my word. Okay. Thank you. When you said that the incidence of re recurrent detachment was higher when ILM peeling or inverted flap was not done, uh, is it to suggest that uh, the recurrence was because of an open macular hole and because of the inverted flap close to the macular hole or was the recurrence not related to macular hole? As I said, we had recurrence, uh, two macular holes opened. One had associated peripheral PVR and a break. One had just opening up of the macular hole in no peel group. So do so you at this think point, yeah, do you sorry. Think inverted flap is uh, helping to keep the hole closed? And yeah. not allowing it to open? Yes, probably yes, ma'am. That's what our hypothesis is, that it helps in better closure and better prevention unless a PVR pulls it up. And in only one case in no peel group, as you said, uh, there was a spontaneous opening as well. So that is what we presume from this particular study at this point of time. Another uh, question, I think we had uh, highlighted this earlier also in the prelim session, is that uh, your choice of uh, doing a peel, if you see a hole that on settlement on putting in, in PFCL is very small, would you still go in for island peeling? In other words, does the size matter in your no. study here? No, once we had randomized it, we never really didn't bother about it, whether it's a small size. Basically, even as I said, pre-operative OCTs could not ascertain the actual that. size of the hole because of the fluid. So we had randomized and once randomized, the whole size was not taken into consideration. Uh, there was just one question regarding the technique, sir. 
regard uh, all uh, inverted flap you have used uh, pfcl but those who are associated with uh, non peeling there you have not used pfcl for the center part uh, stabilization you have direct you have done the direct fluid air exchange no what i did is i never did in any of these cases i don't peel ilm under pfcl first thing i use pfcl in inverted flap technique only to reposit the stuff tissue to stuff the tissue that's it second thing never was macular hole used for drainage we always use peripheral hole for drainage of the srf yeah because in if we majority of the cases if we do the drainage from the periphery then there is always a possibility of some amount of the remaining fluid and in your uh, inverted flap group as because the use of pfcl so there is no residual fluid so do you think that may be one of the reason for uh, you know for the recurrence i didn't say i said i used pfcl for flattening of the holes in all the cases and then pfcl fx was done in all the cases regarding okay. ilm peeling i used ilm uh, pfcl as a support okay. only for uh, stuffing the thing and not for peeling the ilm that's what okay. i mean okay Uh, okay thanks a lot dr bhavan kule very good Thank presentation you. actually all presentations were really mind blowing and it will be very um, <laughs> tough an easy uh, job yeah. now uh, who who do we have to send these score sheets to we still don't get not get an yes, email thank you so much that. judges actually uh, once you are done with the mark sheet uh, just put your signature there on the mark sheet and you just need to either whatsapp it to the number specified there in the mail or you can mail it also to the specific there is no person. number specified there is no mail i have even now i you told me something will be coming it's not come yeah actually one of the can you just can you just put that number in the group yes. can you just yes. put the number in the group okay uh, tell me the number, tell us the number right now Okay. Okay. It's a WhatsApp thing. I'll send it on the group one. That group is full of a lot of uh, other specialities. Yes. No, it's a common number. No, it's a common number for everybody. It's there on the email. Yes. Yes. Can you can you tell us? I'm or? just putting it in the, the WhatsApp group also, madam. Or can you put it on the chat here? Okay, I will do that, madam. Okay. So it was a very good session. I think we will wind up now, and uh, this will give us time to go to our respective next sessions, which start at eleven thirty. Right. So That's I'll take this. I'll grab this opportunity to thank all our judges, Dr. Anand, Dr. Malika, Dr. Muna, and Dr. Rupak. Thank you so much for your screen time presence out here, and to be our judges for the session. I would also like to uh, thank all the uh, presenters who have presented their papers here. uh a very wonderful presentation and all the best to you thank you so much gentlemen and ladies to be 